deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sin from the Father and it thrills my soul just to feel and to know that his blood makes me whole. His grace, yes, his grace reaches, me. reaches me. Yes, his grace, yes, his grace reaches, me. reaches me. And twill last through eternity. Now I'm under his control and I'm happy in my soul just to, just know, to know that his grace reaches me higher than the mountains and brighter than the sun it was offered at Calvary for everyone. Greatest of treasures, and it's mine today. Though my sins were as scarlet, he has washed them away. His grace, yes, his grace reaches me, reaches me. Yes, his grace, yes, his grace reaches, reaches me, me, and twill last through eternity. Now I'm under his control, and I'm happy in my soul, just to, just know, to know that his grace reaches is me we have a number of visitors with us again today and for the benefit of these let me say that last week we saw how after David had established Jerusalem as the capital of the kingdom you know he'd been made king by all of the twelve tribes and one of the first things that he did was to launch an attack on the Jebusite-held city of Jerusalem because, A, it was more central and a far better place from which to administer the affairs of his kingdom. Secondly, because this would test the unity, the newly found unity of the twelve tribes by giving them a common objective and uh, because he saw the fitness of the stronghold itself it was a very very difficult place to take and a very easy place to defend then we saw last week that one of the first things that David did was to make preparations to bring the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem and we saw all the things that happened we saw the death of Asa we saw how David uh, decided finally to do the thing the right way carry the ark on the shoulders of the Levites and we saw also the domestic problem that David experienced when he got up to Jerusalem since Michal his wife had seen him dressed only in a priestly ephod dancing uh, in front of the ark along with the women and the girls who normally did that kind of thing and you saw you remember how she imagined that he'd degraded himself as king in the eyes of his subjects and David said finally no I may be debased in your eyes but uh, the people whom you think I'm debased before will recognize far clearer than you do the significance of my dancing and they will give me honor and that I suggested and the passage suggests at the end of chapter 6 terminated David's relationship with Michael for the rest of his life now it's in chapter 7 David is dwelling in, it says, his house. This is the house that was built for him by Hiram, king of the city of Tyre, and his Phoenician builders. 
You remember that I've said in, in the course of these classes that only the Phoenicians were eventually allowed to share the occupancy of the land of Canaan with David. All of the other tribes were subdued. But David developed a working relationship, which later turned out to be a covenant between Solomon and Hiram. David developed this working relationship with the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were skilled sailors, as everybody knows, probably having come at some time or another, possibly having come, uh, we're not sure about this, from uh, uh, the islands of the Mediterranean, although uh, there is a suggestion that they may have migrated from the east and come from the land of Mesopotamia. But at any rate, they were sailors uh, and they were builders. Their territory, Lebanon, abounded with the famous cedars of Lebanon. And uh, according to the agreement they made with David, they floated uh, the, 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 the logs, almost, uh, I suppose, lumberjack style, down the sea coast to Joppa and brought them ashore and then used them for the erection of buildings for David and for the Israelites because the Israelites were never builders. In fact, as a, when, when I think about the end of the last century, uh, some excavations were done in Jerusalem, they discovered underneath the very temple as it stands today, uh, a huge... I suppose, a quarry, I suppose, is the best way to call it. A quarry uh, which had stones, remains of stones that had been shaped and, and prepared by Phoenician uh, masons. They even had masons' marks in the Phoenician language on them, so that these were the Phoenicians who were used for all the major construction jobs in the land of Israel. And uh, this was a, a pretty good deal that went on between them. Uh, Israel abounded in grain and olives and vines, and the Phoenicians didn't grow very much food. So this was the kind of understanding that was developed between the two people. Uh, the Phoenicians provided the timber and the masons and the carpenters. They did the work, and by way of, of payment, the Israelites provided food. Well, uh, anyway, uh, it was this Hiram who built David his house. It says his house of cedar, actually, in one place, but in fact it was embellished with cedar. No doubt masonry was involved in it, and the, 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 the house was also painted vermilion. Now, what color is vermilion, ladies? A scarlet, a sort of scarlet, isn't it? So this is the kind of situation that developed. Now, here, in verse 1, David is concerned about the fact that he is dwelling in a house, a house of cedar, he calls it, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. Now notice the time when this happened. It says, when the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies round about. Now, I don't think we have to understand from this passage that David had at this stage subdued all of the enemies because after this, in chapter 8, we have the record of a good number of battles that are fought. I think it must have been a time of some peace and prosperity when this happened. And it may even be that considering the moving of the ark in chapter 6, this is connected in the historian's mind with the plan of David to build a temple in which to house the ark. Let me say in passing that the events in, in the first and second books of Samuel don't intend to be exhaustive of David's life and reign. In other words, the historians don't pretend to give a detailed description of all of the events of the life of David. That would be utterly impossible, after all, to describe the events of 40 years in the brief chapters we have in these two books. And First Chronicles 29 and 29 tells you very plainly that that is the case. That particular verse says the rest of the acts of David, the events of the life of David, are recorded in the Chronicles of Samuel the seer, and in the Chronicles of Nathan the prophet, and in the Chronicles of Gad the seer. And, and all that he did, his might, is, reco uh, is recorded in, in these, these particular narratives. So this is really a book prepared on the basis of selection. Inspired selection, let me say. 
though the historian was inspired by God to make a selection of the events of the lives of David and Solomon and others and put these events down on record. And incidentally, that does raise the whole question of inspiration. Sometimes people say, well, how far does inspiration extend in the Bible? Do you mean to tell me that every verse and every little incident is recorded by inspiration? Uh, did, for example, Nathan, who was alive at this time, need inspiration uh, to know what was going on around him? So they say, uh, a historian surely didn't need inspiration. Well, he did need inspiration in a special way. He needed the inspiration, the guidance of God, to know which of the events of the lives of these people were worthy of being recorded. That's where inspiration came in, in guidance as to the selection of the events to be put on record. This is not only the book of the Word of God, it is God's book of words. It doesn't only record what God said, but it also records what God caused to be recorded. For example, God certainly didn't inspire the devil to say, ye shall not surely die. But he certainly recorded the, he certainly inspired the recording of the fact that the devil said it. Uh, so in that sense we must, <coughs> we must un- un- understand inspiration as it relates to history. As it relates to history, the historians were guided by God in their selection of the events to put on record. And that's why we don't have this, this uh, uh, complete record of the life of David. Now, David announces his intention in uh, verse... Two, of building a house for God, a temple in other words. And you notice that Nathan says to the king, go and do all that is in your heart. Now, in the first place, this is the first time that Nathan appears in the historical record. He appears quite suddenly, as you see, and this happened with a good number of Old Testament and New Testament characters for that matter. There's no preamble, there's nothing leading up, there's no personal history of the man given. Quite suddenly the man appears, and as so often happens, he does the job that what God wants him to do, and then he disappears quite as suddenly, unhonored and unsung. However, although we don't know anything about the man's personal life, and although his appearance is so very abrupt and his, dis- his, his departure is, is unsung, as I said, he plays a very important role in the life of David and in the subsequent life of, of uh, uh, Solomon also. For example, not only does he talk to David here about the building of the temple, it's later Nathan who has the, um, let's say, unpleasant task of confronting David about his sin with Bathsheba. It's also uh, Nathan who later on gets to know of the rebellion of Adonijah, one of David's sons and Solomon's brother. Adonijah who plans to usurp the throne. And it's Nathan who along with the (coughs) Zadok the priest anoints Solomon to be king. (coughs) And as I've already shown you in that 1 Samuel 29 and 29, and as a matter of fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 29, Nathan was also an inspired historian. Well, uh, by the way, me, yes, another point here. Let me, let, me, let me also point out that because Nathan was an inspired historian, it doesn't mean that he never made mistakes in his personal life. We must not get the idea that these men were inspired to the point of infallibility. That they never did or said anything wrong. Because we have an instance right now where Nathan jumped to the wrong conclusion. Very naturally when David announced his intention of building a temple for God, Nathan approved of that. It seemed a very fine idea, a very fine project. And he says to him, go and do all that is in your heart. The Lord is with you. And Nathan was wrong about that. Of course, it seemed a good idea, as I say. But it's in the night, verse 4 tells us, that same night, that the word of the Lord comes to to Nathan, no doubt in a vision, no doubt in a dream. We've discussed this before. And God points out to Nathan that David is not the man to build the temple. 
God points out that uh, certainly right from the very beginning he has dwelt in a tent. Now obviously you don't take this literally. You don't imagine God living in a tent. God is talking of the Ark of the Covenant representative of his presence with his people. And right from the very beginning through that wilderness journey even until they got into the land of Canaan uh, the Ark had certainly been housed in the tabernacle. In curtains, God calls it here. And if you go back to the book of Exodus, <coughs> you'll discover that that's exactly how the Ark of the Covenant is described as being in curtains. But we'll come on to that in just a moment. Uh, at the moment, the Ark of the Covenant is in Gibeon, Gibeon of Saul. You remember that Gibeon was the place where Zadok the priest was functioning. It was a very... A very high, it was, it's called a high place, as a matter of fact, an ancient high place. A place of, of uh, religious activity, a center of worship. And, and the tabernacle is still there. I pointed out last week that although David made plans to bring the ark up to Jerusalem, he didn't plan to bring the tabernacle, lest that cause trouble among the people. It, the move might have been resented, moving it from this ancient sanctuary uh, to Jerusalem. And furthermore, remember that at the time there were two high priests functioning. There was uh, the high priest Abiathar, whom David had appointed, who'd been with him all through his travels, and there was Zadok appointed by Saul. So, David didn't want really to cause friction among his people. He certainly didn't want to destroy the newly found unity. So, he left, first of all, the tabernacle down there in, in Gibeon, where Zadok ministered and made plans just to bring the ark up. And he housed the ark temporarily in a tent of his own making. But now he feels that a more permanent residence has to be found for the ark of the covenant. And consequently, he makes the plan to build the temple. Now, God points out here in verse uh, uh, 5, Thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? Now, that's expressed in the negative. But if you were to turn to First Chronicles 17, and verse 14, verse 4 rather, you'll find that it's expressed positively. Thou shalt not build me a temple. And the reasons given, reasons given in First Chronicles 22 and verse 8. Let, well, let me read this because I think it's, uh, it expresses it very, very plainly. First Chronicles 22, beginning at verse 8. David speaking. Well, I'll, I'll begin at verse 7. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, you have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood before me upon the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you. He shall be a man of peace. I will give him peace from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon. And I will give him peace and quiet to, to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. So God says, no, you're not going to build me a house. And God points out that right from the beginning, he's been moving about in curtains or in a tent for his dwelling. And he said, I never asked anybody to build me a, te a temple. And nobody ever thought of building me a temple. And that is really the thing that commends David in the eyes of God. God isn't rebuking David for suggesting that he should build a temple. He's not, as you might at first think as you read this passage, uh, expressing displeasure with David. When he says, for example, uh, I, never say, I never commanded my people Israel saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? In other words, he's saying, I, I never asked for it. No, he's not really saying that. He's really commending David. And uh, he's pointing out that although he will not allow David to build him a house, the thought has so commended David to him that God says, I will build you a house instead. And that's, it's really, it, 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 it's, it's quite, to my mind, a, a nice twist, isn't it? God says, you want to build me a house. Well, I don't want you to build me a house, but I'll tell you what, I will build you a house. And he's not talking about a temple, he's not talking about a palace, he's talking about a dynasty, he's talking about a royal family. 
Now, uh, and by the way, this is expressed three times as being forever. God says forever. He's confirming his promise to David. He, first of all, in verse 8, reminds David of his very common origins. Look at verse 8. He says, I took you from the pasture, from the sheep coat, I think the authorized version has. I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep. He's pointing out he's a very, very ordinary person. He's just a humble shepherd. Then he points out to David his constant care in verse 9. He says, I have been with you wherever you went. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. And then he talks about his continued blessing in that same verse. I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones in the earth. So, first, David's common origin, God's constant care, and God's continued blessing. And then he, in this message that, that Nathan delivers to David, there are involved six items, three concerning Israel and three concerning David. Look at verse 10. The first is a place for David, a place of honor. I will make your name great among the, among the great ones of the earth, among the honored ones. And then in verse 2, there's a place, a position for David, a place for Israel. Also in verse 10, God says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. A place and a planting. I will plant them, which means I will establish them. No longer are there going to be nomads wandering uh, across the face of the earth. But they're going to have a place that's going to belong all to themselves. I will plant them. As a matter of fact, one of the Psalms uh, speaks about the way that God brought a vine out of Egypt. It's drive out the inhabitants before it. It's plant it. It's establish it in the land. Making them solid. Making them firm. So a position, a place, a planting... A peaceful existence for Israel's mention too. God says, I will give you rest from all your enemies. There's posterity for David. He says, eh, Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. And a perpetual kingdom, in verse 16 there, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, your throne shall be established forever. So there are the six items. As to Israel, there's a place, a planting, and a peace. As to David, there's a position, there's posterity, there's perpetuity of his kingdom. And that brings us to this very famous passage beginning there at verse 14. God says, no, not verse 14, verse 12. When your days are fulfilled, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth out of your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son when he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now that's a very famous passage. It's quoted in the New Testament. The significant thing about the New Testament quotation is that it runs up to verse 14. It includes verses 12 to 14. I will be his father and he shall be, to, um, be my son. It doesn't continue when he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, for a very good reason. That those two verses, uh, three verses, 12 to 14, are messianic. They refer to the Messiah, they refer to Jesus Christ. So the latter part wouldn't apply to him. When he commits iniquity, I will chasten him. The latter part applies to the one to whom the prophecy was first, uh, for whom the prophecy was first made, and whom it first concerned, which was Solomon. So this, this really is a passage that has a double meaning. Primarily, initially, when it was first made, it was made concerning Solomon, David's son and heir. 
But in the wider sense, it referred to David's greater son, the Messiah who was to come. And there's another interesting thing about this passage. You'll notice that the continuation of Solomon's throne is promised, but there's not a continuation of Solomon's house promised. In other words, Solomon is not promised a perpetual house like his father David was promised. The promises that concern Solomon are that he will be allowed to build a temple and that his kingdom will be established in contrast with that of Saul, whom God's kingdom, uh, whom, whom, uh, whose kingdom God had taken away. When Solomon sins, he will be chastened, but unlike Saul, he will not be deposed. Now, that's the extent of the promise made concerning Solomon. It didn't concern David's greater son, the Messiah, who was to come, who would have a perpetual kingdom. And th this is interesting, because it shows you how remarkably accurate the New Testament is. And how this has worked out in history, too. You remember that later on, after the death of Solomon, the kingdom was divided. You have the two, the two uh, kingdoms in the south, uh, rather two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin. And you have the ten tribes in the north, uh, making Israel. So Israel to the north, Judah to the south, the divided kingdom. That was when, when Solomon lost the united kingdom. Now, Israel to the north had a total of nine dynasties. Family after family came along. Of course, altogether they have the same number of kings, about 119 kings all told, both in the north and in the south. But the thing is, that while the 119 kings of the north came from nine different royal families, every single one of the kingdom of the kings from the south came from the same family, came from the house of David. And, and you see this when you come over to the New Testament as well. Jesus was born of Mary, not of Joseph. Now, both Mary and Joseph were of the royal house. As a matter of fact, we're told by Luke they were of the house and lineage of David. Well, they were. They both could trace their ancestries back to David, but not through the same person. If you go back to Matthew's account, you'll discover that Solomon traced, uh, that, that Joseph traced his ancestry back to David through Solomon. But Mary traces her ancestry back to David through Nathan, another son of David. Now the interesting thing is that Solomon's line as king ended with Jeconiah. You'll find this in Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 30, uh, where God says, write this man childless. He says, there shall no one of this man's line prosper any more sitting on the throne of Israel. So the royal line, so far as earthly kings are concerned, came to an end when Jeconiah or Coniah was the last king of Judah. They went into captivity. And if Jesus Christ had been the son of Joseph, tracing his ancestry back to Solomon, through Jeconiah, Jesus could never have sat upon the throne of David anyway, anyhow. But it doesn't work out like that. Mary is the descendant of Nathan, the son of David. And so whilst Jesus could never sit on the earthly throne of Israel, he is sitting on the throne of David spiritually today as David's greatest son. It just shows you how the, you know, sometimes you wonder about these genealogies and you get some of these smart alecks today and say, well, these, these folk are mixed up. The historians don't know what they're talking about. Well, it's the scholars today who often don't know what they're talking about because they never take the trouble to get into, into, the, into an understanding of, of, of the work of the Holy Spirit in inspiring these records. There's, there's purpose for this. Matthew and Luke are not contradicting each other. They're telling you something. They're telling you that while Jesus is the, the, the seed of David after the flesh, it is not as the seed of David after the flesh that he inherits the throne of David. It's because he's the seed of David after the spirit. Or as Paul writes to the Romans, uh, he's the seed of David after the, he's the, he's the seed of David after the flesh, but he's, he's David's Lord after the spirit. Of, he's certainly of the house of Lynn. He's, well, he's the offspring of David, 
But at the same time, he's the root of David. He's the one from whom David himself came. And I like that passage where Jesus proves this himself. He says, what think you of Christ? Whose son is he? Well, they said, David's son. He said, right. If he's David's son, why then did David call him Lord, saying, Jehovah said to my master, Jehovah God said to my master, and my master is Christ there, the Messiah, sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If he's his son, Jesus repeats, why then did he call him Lord? So this is really one of those, those, those marvelous passages. And by the way, it's one of the passages so frequently encountered in the New Testament. Well, you, you must remember that in Acts chapter 2, Peter quotes it. And what's he proving? He's proving that Jesus is sitting on David's throne today. He says in Acts 2 at verse 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David. He's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. He being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins he would raise up one to sit on his throne. Now, that's this passage, isn't it? He, seeing this before, spake not of the second coming of Christ, or of the millennial reign, but he spake of the resurrection of Christ. Now, what, what, what's Peter saying? He's saying, look, because David was a prophet, and he knew that God would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne, he looked to the resurrection of Christ, because when Christ was raised from the dead, he was raised from the dead, as the raising talked about to David, to sit on David's throne. And that's why Peter concludes, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made, not he's going to make, he has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So what's Peter saying? He's simply saying this, look, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was raised in the true fulfillment of that amazing promise made to David way back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 14. And, David is sit and Jesus is sitting on David's throne today, reigning over his people. Now, of course, there's another interesting thing too. Parts of this particular passage are used in different places in the New Testament. And, and I've been struck by the fact that inspired writers of the New Testament often took Old Testament passages and applied them in ways that I would never have dreamed of. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, where Paul is speaking about sanctification and about holiness, about come ye out from among them and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And you'll notice that in that passage, he takes part of this verse, uh, well, let, let, me, let me turn it, turn it up and let me read it for you. Because it also involves 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. 2 Corinthians 6, notice, Therefore come out from among them, verse 17, and set, be separate from them, saith, saith the Lord, and touch nothing unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Almighty. Now this quite definitely is a reference to this promise way back in Second Samuel 7. And notice that Paul goes on to say in verse 1 of chapter 7, Since we have these promises. In other words, this promise of God being a father and we being sons to him is the promise of all those who are children of God by faith, born again. Members of his family. Again, uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 32, you have a reference to this passage. Because the angel said, The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Israel forever. So the angel knew of that passage too. As a matter of fact, it's also there in, in Psalm 132, verse 11. David never forgot it. He remembered it. And he quotes it in that psalm. Oh, I can give you some more passages too. It's in John 7 and 42. It's pretty evident in that verse that the people understood this passage as referring not just to Solomon, but as to the Messiah being the son of David. This is really one of the strongest messianic passages in the whole of the Bible, showing not only the sonship of Christ with God, but also the kingship of Christ. And it's mentioned way back in the Revelation, chapter 21 and verse 7. So, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times there's reference made uh, to the same promise. Have you any comments on that? 
King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed, guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let me, like Mary, through the gloom come with a gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for Thee, even thy cup of grief to share, Thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget Thine agony, lest I forget Thy love for me, Lead me to Calvary. Gone is all my debt of sin, A great change is brought within, And to live I now begin, Risen from the fall. Yet the debt I did not pay, Someone died for me one day, Sweeping all the dead away, Jesus paid it all. Jesus died and paid it all, Yes, on the cross of Calvary, And my starting heart was melted, at his dying, dying call. Oh, his heart in shame was broken on the tree for you and me. Yes, and the death of his death is canceled. Jesus paid it, paid it all. Oh, I hope to please him now. Light of joy is on my brow, as at his dear feet I bow, safe within his love. Making his the dead I hold, freedom true he has bestowed, so I'm singing on the road to my home above. Jesus died and paid it all, yes, on the cross of Calvary. And my starting heart was melted at his dying, dying call. Oh, his heart in shame was broken on the tree for you and me, yes, and the death. His death is cancelled, Jesus has paid it, paid it all. Sinner not for me alone, did the Son of God atone. Your debt to he made his own on the cruel tree. Come to him with all your sin, be as white as snow within, 
Full salvation you may win and rejoice with me. Jesus died and paid it all, yes, on the, the cross of Calvary. And my starting was heart was melted at his dying, dying call. Oh, his heart in shame was broken on the tree for you and me. Yes, and the death is canceled. Jesus paid it, paid it.